as Yuri was bringing the spacecraft in for the, the first manual approach, we were just aware that things were not going right. We had another failure, um, which meant the computer screen went down. So Tim and I were effectively blind. And that was the point I realized this approach is, is, is just not good. And Yuri, um, actually his hand started trembling on the controllers. You don't get to choose how and when you become an astronaut. You really have to wait until a space agency wants a selection process. And for me, I was very lucky that happened in 2008 when I was leaving the Army anyway. I had the operational experience, 3,000 hours of flying helicopters, um, and I thought I'm in the right place to apply to become an astronaut. Um, and I, along with 8,500 other people, filled in the application form. The hard skills to some degree, once you've passed that first day of testing, they can teach you. They can teach you how to speak Russian. They can teach you how to spacewalk. They can teach you how to fly a Soyuz spacecraft. But if you don't get on with people, if you haven't got the soft skills, if you haven't got the interpersonal skills, then you're not going to be suitable for the job. So the selection process is making sure they've got the right type of person to begin with. The moment when I got the phone call was um, incredible because I, I, I thought the phone call was the rejection phone call. Uh, I thought it was a joke at first, and I thought he's, he's not, people don't joke about this kind of thing. So of course I, I was excited, I was elated. This is when you kind of jump on the conveyor belt ride for two and a half years that's going to take you towards that seat on the Soyuz spacecraft. We spent hours training in a simulator where every known emergency is thrown at us. Uh, in the early part of our training, more often than not, we would fail. And um, <laughs> it's very humbling to be told that you come out of a simulator session and you would have died. Uh, failure is the, the best teacher and it, it makes you work stronger and better together so that the next time that happens, you survive. Before launch, you've got moments of nervousness and anxiety and apprehension, but you really deal with that before you get on top of the rocket. Launch is exciting. I mean, it's all about noise, power, uh, nine million horsepower lifting you off, accelerating at the, the rate of a Formula One car. But it's, um, it's like a, a fairground ride on steroids. It's something that you can comprehend and enjoy and, and, and be excited about. We, we came over the Pacific and I remember looking out the window into this blackness of the Pacific Ocean. And the first thing that happened was the moon rose over the ocean with this beautiful moonlight glimmering off the Pacific. Uh, and it just felt incredibly special to be able to, to see that. And once you're up in space and the rocket is, is horizontal, you're aware of just going at a phenomenal speed and the rocket is still accelerating. It's getting you up to 25 times the speed of sound. And that's hard to comprehend. Um, I mean, I'd flown fast jets before, but uh, nothing ever um, compares to the, the, the acceleration and the speed of a rocket. And then it stops very violently. You go from 4G to 0G in a fraction of a second, and then everything goes quiet, really eerily quiet after the noise of a launch, and, and everything floats. Anything that's not strapped down floats up. The Soyuz were suddenly flooded with uh, all this sunlight coming in. And again, I looked out, and there was the first sunrise coming up over the Earth. And that's when the, the colors of the Earth just struck me. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful. It's, it's like this magnificent blue and green jewel against the vast blackness of the universe. As Yuri was bringing the spacecraft in for the, the first manual approach, we were just aware that things were not going right. We had another failure, um, which meant the computer screen went down. So Tim and I were effectively blind. Yuri was using a small periscope to try and line himself up. The sun was going down behind us and reflecting all the light off the space station. So Yuri was being blinded. Mission Control were distracting him with an awful lot of chatter from the radio. And, and that was the point I realized this approach is, is, is just not good. And Yuri, um, actually his hand started trembling on the controllers. He was on his sixth mission to space. So I thought, if Yuri's not comfortable with this situation, then, um, then it's really not good. We had yawed off target, um, were drifting back along the space station and actually came very close to uh, a collision. So Yuri thankfully recognized the danger, backed off, got everything lined up again and brought it in for a, a textbook second manual approach. So we were just thankful to be there at that point. A normal day in space is up at about 6.30. At 7 o'clock we have a round the world tag up with all the mission control centers that help to plan and coordinate the day on the space station. So that's uh, Houston to Huntsville to Moscow, Munich and Tokyo. And then we get on with science. 
The purpose of the space station is primarily a laboratory to do science uh, in microgravity. So uh, any scientist wants to change parameters, pressure, temperature, humidity, whatever it is, and, uh, and do science and find out how that changes things. And in space, we've changed gravity. Everything here on Earth for four billion years has evolved in a 1G environment. In space, we go to 0G. And so um, we're finding out new things about the human body, uh, about material science, how to make metal alloys that are light and elastic and have uh, qualities that we simply can't replicate back here on Earth. Uh, and that's helping us to get closer to lightweight, efficient technologies for um, engine, aircraft engines, for example, or developing drugs for motor neuron disease, Parkinson's disease. But in addition to the science, we're also there to explore. So it's about how we can live and work in space for longer so we can make the next steps to the Moon and eventually to Mars. We're still finding out about the long-term effects of spaceflight. We know that your muscles and your bone will atrophy, and we've done an awful lot of work over the years to stop that from happening. So we know how we should exercise in space because we're trying to stop our bodies from adapting to space too much because we need to be fit and healthy for coming back to Earth. So we do about an hour and a half, two hours of fitness every day as well. Um, we're starting to get better about the nutrition that we have in space as well to, to stop that. But we also know that our skin ages, our eyesight changes, our immune system becomes depleted, and we're more prone to blood clots. And, and these are relatively new things that we found out. I guess the, the longest lasting effect is the radiation dose, because that's um, very hard to quantify what the effects will be. We, we get the equivalent of eight chest x-rays a day on board the space station, so it's, it's not trivial. What was the funniest thing you can remember happening to you? We were up there for a long period of time, and um, you know we were all of a similar type of personality. So we would play play tricks and jokes on each other. Um, uh, Scott Kelly even managed to get a gorilla suit up on board the space station. I have no idea how he managed it, um, which was hilarious. We had a lot of uh, fun with that. Um, uh, and so I think that's the, the nice thing about being in space, are those lighter moments where you actually have some normality, even though you're in this uh, incredibly uh, precarious situation. When you were told that you were going to how did you feel about that? Things breaking in space you don't normally like, but if it means that you're going to get the opportunity to do a spacewalk, then we're all for it. So Tim Coper and I had to suit up and go and repair this solar panel at the furthest edge of the space station. This, most people will recognize, is a drink bag, um, but it's a drink bag that we use when we're out on a spacewalk. What we have to do before a spacewalk is fill this up with water from our water dispenser inside the space station, and it's got Velcro here, so we would stick that on the inside of our hard upper torso in our spacesuit. And then when we squeeze ourselves into our spacesuit, it will be resting here, and we make sure that this is just poking up into our helmet. So outside in the spacewalk, we don't have anything to eat, um, but we do have something to drink. A spacewalk traditionally lasts uh, anywhere between six and eight hours. Once we've gone through the effort of um, suiting up and all the preparation, you want the spacewalk to try and achieve as much as possible. You're in this confined environment, um, cocooned in, in, it's like being in an ocean liner. And then when you go out on a spacewalk, it's, it's a bit like just diving off the ocean liner into the big blue sea. Um, this, you're in this spacesuit and, and you can maneuver yourself around you've just got a thin visor between you and the vacuum. The risk is palpable when you're hanging off the space station, but it's also um, an incredibly calm, serene environment to be in. Uh, it's, I, I've done free fall parachuting and it's not the same. It's not like an, a, a huge adrenaline rush. There are moments, certainly, when the adrenaline is up, but for the majority of the time, it's a beautiful, calm, serene experience being out there and being able to look around at the universe. The return to Earth is a, is a mixture of uh, it's really hurry up and wait because you undock from the space station and you feel incredibly vulnerable in this tiny Sawyer's capsule. You've got used to the space station um, in its enormity for six months and the Sawyer spacecraft feels very, very small and vulnerable. And the first orbit of Earth is actually nothing very much to do. It's very quiet. You're just enjoying your last orbit. But then everything happens in the, in the second orbit. That's when you burn the engines and this is what's going to start to bring you back down to Earth. Because the only reason you're staying in orbit is because you've achieved 25 times the speed of sound. And the only way to come home is to put the brakes on. So we turn the spacecraft around and burn the engine in the direction of travel, and that slows us down. But that engine burn has to be very, very accurate. Um, if you burn for too long, you're gonna come in too steep, 
and that could risk uh, damage to the spacecraft, possibly burning up. And if you don't burn for long enough, you're not going to come back. You're going to go through the upper layers of the atmosphere and back out into space. So we're very cautious when we start the engine on a rocket, uh, or a spacecraft rather, that has been in space for six months. It's a bit like starting a car after a long, cold winter and just hoping that it's going to work OK. My job was to do all the mental arithmetic to work out how to long to burn the thrusters for if the primary engine di didn't work. Um, so having got my D in maths at school, <laughs> I'm always amazed that that task fell on my hands. Um, but thankfully, the engine burn went well. And and we are then set on a course for coming back to Earth. The next thing that happens in this scheme of things is separation. So the spacecraft is in three parts, but only the descent module is going to come back to Earth. The other two modules will burn up in the atmosphere. So the spacecraft separates itself, which is quite an explosive event, pyrotechnic bolts going off, um, blowing the spacecraft into three chunks. And then from that moment onwards, the descent module, where the three crew members are sat, is pretty much out of control, just tumbling end over end, waiting for the Earth's atmosphere to pick up the spacecraft and right it in the correct direction, heat shield first. Looking out the window at that point is uh, it's quite unnerving because you're, you're seeing the Earth going over and over as you're tumbling. And it's also only about 150, 200 kilometers beneath you. You've been used to seeing the Earth from up at 400 kilometers. So it suddenly feels very, very close. And you're very aware that you're just falling like a brick. And the whole re-entry takes about eight minutes. And during that time, a ball of plasma will be forming around the spacecraft, gets up to 1700 Celsius outside, so extremely hot outside. Uh, and you're very, very hot inside because there's no air conditioning. You're simply recirculating the same air and trying to get some airflow through your suit. And then uh, just when you think that's you know, finished and done with, the parachutes open. Uh, we're still going just over the speed of sound at this point. So when braking parachutes come out, it's very, very violent. And the spacecraft is flung around um, underneath these parachutes. Um, and that lasts for about 20 seconds until we get a, a big jolt of the main canopy opening and then 15 minutes before we impact with the ground. What do you think is the future for space travel? We're already set on going back to the moon and we've got firm plans for that and, and Europe is very much part of those plans. So we'll see, see that happening over the next decade. We'll see a return to the moon, but not with an intention just for a two-week mission. This is with the intention for a sustained and sustainable presence. So building habitation modules on the surface of the moon using the resources in situ. I think commercial companies such as uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin uh, are doing great things in space because what they're doing is reducing the cost of access to space space by pushing technologies forward um, and also by commercializing low Earth orbit it allows the, the, na the national space agencies to be able to use their resources for doing deep space exploration and that will be a stepping stone onto Mars which will probably be the 2030s and beyond to have the first human missions to Mars. Space holds a special place in many people's hearts in terms of it's a place where you can dream, you can explore, your mind can wander about the possibilities. I, th I think it's only natural that we are drawn to that. When you ask people, you know, what would you like to be in, and, and many young boys and girls say an astronaut, you can understand why, because it's, it's the future, it, it's exploration, it's pushing those boundaries. I looked up and I could see two guys with a, um, a PKM uh, belt-fed um, Russian machine gun and they were hammering down on the lads. And my rifle only shoots 1500 metres so I had to, I call it lob in, I lobbed the bullet in 